This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come solely from personal experience. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all audiences. Please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. second book in the Symphony of Ages. Our trio of heroes form alliances, build bridges, and gain that which they thought had been lost long ago. Hi, I'm Nicole. And I'm Robin. And this fortnight on Books That Burn, we are discussing Prophecy, Child of Earth. And let's get into our factions. We have Meridian, Rhapsody, Achmed, Grunthor, Joe, Ashi, Lauren, Prudence, Tristan Stewart, Fedor, and the Rakshas. Our first topic is Ashi and bodily autonomy. You were particularly interested in this topic. Yeah, this one is an interesting magical version of loss of bodily autonomy. Because... So Ash, as a person, is not being controlled or cor- or or um, uh, coerced. coerced. Thank you in any way. But uh, in the story, a piece of his soul was taken to rebirth a a magical monster. He didn't consent to giving up that piece of his soul at all. So already. His bodily, his bodily autonomy was violated by the theft of that piece of him. Um, but also, this creature, the Rakshas, that was used, that was created from this this part of him, uh, because it's powered by his soul, it's using his form, or a replica of his form, to go places and talk to people and do things. Um and that includes the rape and murder and ritual sacrifice that it was intended to do. So yeah. it's it's a weird situation because there are several different points in this book where Ash wasn't there and didn't do something. <laughs> and everybody assumes he did because this replica, this walking and talking creature that looks and acts well like well when it wants to acts like him and for all intents and purposes you know seems to be him uh is going around harming people um actually to make it even worse uh there was a very long time and this isn't technically related related to the topic but it does make this easier for him to be kind of ostracized and, and blamed for things there was a very long time where he intentionally let the world believe he was dead. And so then this construct just comes back and it's just doing things and pretending to be him. And so at that point, it's very hard for him to say, well, look, it's not me because actually I was over here when he's been hiding <laughs> and not letting anybody know he's even alive for a very long time. So at that point, coming back and kind of proving that, you know, these things that are happening are not him is, is next to impossible. And currently, it's only theoretical that he might try and come back and prove that it wasn't him, because currently, he's just staying well away from trying that. Right, because, like, knowing this is a thing is a deterrent. He hasn't even tried Mm -hmm. this yet. Right. But, but, you know, even if he was, even if he was going to come behind and say, like, well, you know, this wasn't me, like, he doesn't have anything to stand on to even, even try. Like, that would be the, that would be the obvious quote-unquote solution right it's just like prove well uh-huh. we're two separate people but it's hard when you're presumed dead <laughs> um and so you have no character witnesses you have no anybody you have no 
uh, support network. You have no reason to have been seen anywhere. You have nothing. Um, and, and that doesn't even get into, uh, we find out at a later point in the book that everything that, that Rakshas did while powered by his soul, while existing with his soul, um, the soul has like a, a, a memory of. And so his, his soul was being harmed. The piece of his soul that it, it had was being, was being in a very magical way, but physically harmed by those acts committed by the Rakshas. Yeah, and we kind of find out that that's definitely going to be a thing, um, kind of with the implication yeah. that we're probably going to deal with that more in the next book. But yeah, it's it's a lot. And yeah, and about uh, an interesting thing with it being the replica of him is that it's not the replica of him like now. No, it's how he looked 20 years ago when this first happened, which means it looks more like what people will think he is than he does now. Oh, yeah, that is that is definitely a, a pretty important piece of this, too, is that um, like he is he is again presumed dead for years so he does not look the same um so even proving his identity versus the rakshas is like could even potentially be like a, a major struggle major um thing you'd have to do over and over again yeah it's probably gonna be a major hurdle in a later book for sure and it's this concept is kind of an odd one because it's definitely a viola- the theft of his soul was definitely a violation of his bodily autonomy and 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 right to you know consent to something or or deny consent to to a piece of him um but it almost comes down to like this whole secondary thing that after that initial theft that piece of his soul is just a captive wandering around being injured by things that are happening. And there's, it's like, there's layers to this. Like, even if he had consented to giving up that piece of his soul, you could even, at that point, even if he had not consented to having it, you know, emotionally, metaphysically, magically tortured by this stuff, um, you could argue, it would still have been a, a, a breach of his bodily autonomy and consent if that was still happening to it anyway. Um, exactly. Or, or, or if nothing had happened to it and it was just torn from him and stuck in a jar and put underground somewhere and nothing bad ever happened ever again, like it would still be a a violation of his bodily autonomy. So the way that this Mm -hmm. happens, there's, there's multi levels, (laughs) there's tiers to, to the violation happening to him. Like, to the point that I almost wanted to be cheeky and call this soul autonomy, but that would imply an entirely different concept (laughs) from what we're actually discussing, and so that's not what we titled this. Yeah. But, like, uh, this is, like, the most magical of magical analogs for a concept. Because, I don't know, like, it's, like, there's, like, all this, like, evil twin trope things, but, like, at least when, as a trope, there's an evil twin you possibly had a chance to, like, I don't know, like, it It really, really feels like the whole evil twin thing, except they did something to him first. And yeah, it's like, spoiler alert, your evil twin is actually a piece of you, and it's not actually a twin at all. It's yeah, just and like, you know, shadow yeah. versions are, they're a thing, like, that's a known trope, but this feels like... Right. This like extra twisty bit of it. We talked about the, the the difficulty that this would make with like getting back to his normal life, but it's causing him a lot of problems now. I, I'm not even going as far as normal life. I'm just saying as far as like he shows up in a place that this creature has been to. Mm-hmm. And right now he has True. to say, like, no, I'm not terrible and I wasn't here and I don't know what you're talking about. And at the same time, it's his soul committing these acts. And so there's, there's, I don't, I don't think it's this book. I think it might be the third one, but there are definitely moments where he has like to, to reconcile with that and say like, 
well, am I responsible? And the answer is no. <laughs> mm-hmm. But he had to think about it. But he has to come to that conclusion of like, Am I responsible for the desecrations performed by somebody else using a piece of who I am? And that's a lot. That's a big deal. And in terms of how the author is portraying this, because, you know, the author is the one inflicting it on him, a lot of the stuff in the narrative, like scenes are a cross cut. They're placed next to each other in a way to imply for a fairly long time that it is actually him and he's just terrible. And like the cross cutting keeps going for a while, including one very dramatic place that we're going to talk about later. Um, the cross cutting continues to make it feel very uncertain as to whether it was him doing it or not. Like there's something that happens where I called Nicole and I was like, I want to rage quit this book. I need you to tell me that it, that the Rakshas is completely not him and that he didn't do this because I was extremely upset. Um, And that one scene, as Robin pointed out to me before we started recording, that one scene is we, we only are under the perception that it might have been him for less than 10 pages. But it's Something still like a that. Lot. It's very short. Yeah. It's, it still feels and narratively like it's a, it's a huge moment. It's a big deal. Yeah. It definitely felt like the author saying, you thought he was good. You were wrong all along. The fractious <laughs> is a terrible, terrible thing. forever. Yeah. Right. No, but that's and not true. That- but in terms of the reader experience, like being placed in that state where like, I couldn't tell was very frustrating and wrenching. And I only needed to read, you know, 10 to 15 more pages to <laughs> find out what was going on. But yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, a very dramatic way to wrap up that idea. It's a fairly uh-huh. dramatic book. In a good way. But yeah, definitely something where if you um if you're coming into it and you don't know how it's gonna end. Yeah, the highs are very high and the lows are very, very low. So this is possibly our longest topic name ever. That's how it feels right now. Uh, So the topic is weaponization of female bodies against their loved ones, which is a, it's a strange kind of objectification, but I think it fits under the general heading of objectification of women. Um, Yeah. But it's it's weird because it's like more nuanced and more specific than that. There are Two big things. Yeah, there's a very specific lens that this happens through in this book, and it happens in more than one way and in more than one circumstance and with more than one uh, power dynamic. But it is the same yeah. thing happening. Yeah, simply calling it objectification of women wouldn't let y'all know what you're in for. Uh, <laughs> so the, the first one... Now, Prudence is murdered by the Rakshas, and the way that it was done, we don't know whether she was killed and then eaten, or eaten and then killed, because part of how she's terrified is by being told that, hey, it could be one order or the other, and then the scene cuts away. Um, and then her, the, her remains are tossed off a cliff, and this is all done as a frame job to try and incite her lover to make war against this other kingdom. And it has literally nothing to do with her except that she is this person that this guy cares about. And that she just came from visiting that other kingdom. And so, like, literally her body is is being used to try and start a war, which is about as, to me, as as literal as weaponization of a body can get. Yeah. 
Yeah, very extremely, Mm -hmm. extremely literal. It. So we need to frame these in context, I think. Okay. Because they are. What context would you like? Well, so the thing is, for both of these, these characters, um, I would like to throw in, I realize this is book two. And we're saying both because we're going to describe a second setup that fits into this topic. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, before I get to that, I want to... Now I can't remember. Did we already learn in book two? Because I've read all of these before. Uh, right. Did we already learn in book two about what happened with Rhapsody's former client? I do not know the his fate. No. No, not his fate, but what he did to the... The child. We we don't know what he actually did. We know what he threatened to do okay. and what it made Rhapsody do. Okay. That fits under this category. Okay, yes. Also. So there's um, a discussion of this weaponization, even though it happened technically in book it's one. Te- well, I mean, it's technically prior to book one. It was technically like well, backstory all it happened the way before in between book one. The pr- it happened in in between the prologue of book one and the, and the main action yes. of book one. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. Um, but yeah, the, I just I want to make sure we don't lose that situation too. So oh, we yeah. really have three different setups. I'm going to do them in um, uh, actual real chronological order. So at first, uh, Rhapsody was a a sex worker who had a client threaten to rape a child. Um, if she didn't have sex with him. Um, and then she finds out later that he was doing it anyway. Um, do we know that? We do. By book two? Uh, I don't remember if it's by book two. (laughs) But yeah, no, no, she, she knew that and she talked about that making her angry because it was happening anyway. Um. Do not remember that. That's not fair. saying you're wrong. I'm just saying as of book two, I do not remember having learned that. That's fair. Um, but no, like that is that is one also another weaponization of a of a a a female character and a, a child female character, but still a female character to force somebody else to do something. Um, and then we have um, Prudence. Uh, oh, I just described. You just described. And then we have Joe. Um, who was raped and not technically impregnated. Kind of. I but feel like... Because it wasn't a baby. But... I, I, the, the, so we use the term pregnancy in a very specific case to imply that it is a baby. But technically sense to be pregnant is to be full of something that you're making like the word is flexible enough to encompass what happened here okay that's fair but it was not a pregnancy with a baby this is true uh she she was having her body taken over by a controlling piece of the fedor is what was happening yeah um we see it as a tentacle like a vine tentacle with thorns yeah yeah so we have three and and joe's the point of 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 harming joe was to get rhapsody to react to it and also to um also because it was rhapsody and because it was joe specifically to uh implicate ash Mm -hmm. and there's a very so these are all very disparate circumstances, but a common thread running through them is that the victim isn't the point, and the victim of the actual the actual rape, the actual attack, the actual the actual trauma, violence. the violence, yeah, uh, is expendable <laughs> to the person doing it. There's, and very there's much this... not expendable to the people around them, specifically. Right, right. Not expendable to the people around them. But the whole threat here is, I don't care 
about this person you care about, which means that it doesn't hurt me to hurt them to get to you. And 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 this is important to talk about because so that's some pretty pretty terrifying, pretty awful <laughs> um setups. All three of them, right? Yeah. But in the way that the author handles them, at no point do we ever get the feeling that those, as a reader, that those characters are actually expendable. Oh, yeah, because the point is very much that, like, they are important and taking care of the lives of the vulnerable is important. And yes. at least for the two where Rhapsody is in play and cares about them. Actually, Rhapsody tries three, to three. save all three of them. Rhapsody is not the person that Prudence's murder was meant to hurt directly. No, but, but Rhapsody is our um our Yeah, but Rhapsody I, I was gonna say the, the way that the way that Tristan cares about Prudence is still a little squicky. But, uh, but a lot squicky. Rhapsody genuinely cares for all of these people and like has a vision of Prudence's fate and like sends someone to like watch her and take care of her and to, like to follow and make sure that nothing happens. And then it happens after that person can no longer follow because she is in a different kingdom now. And just when our main point of view character is deeply invested in caring about people, um, it, it means that even though the person who specifically cares about prudence is like kind of dark and twisty and like not great and it can be hard to have sympathy for him we still have the feeling that the author very much cares and understands and doesn't see prudence as expendable doesn't see this unnamed kid as expendable and definitely doesn't see joe as yeah well and that's the thing too is like for all of these characters uh, I think the the backstory child is the one that we get the least of, but definitely for the other two, we we have enough things about them before something happens to them for us as as readers to care about them and be invested in them also, and it's it's very. I, I kind of said this to, to Robin in our setup too. It's very much a call out of the mistreatment of these characters and not a perpetuation of the concept that female characters are expendable. It flies directly in the face of that kind of trope of like female characters only mattering because they matter to somebody else in a way, because these characters very much do matter to other people. And that's the plot point. But these characters don't feel shoehorned in. They don't feel expendable to us as readers. And so when something happens to them, especially when something happens to them where someone is dismissing them as an object, we as readers care very much. And it's clear that the author cares very much. And that that and dismissal of them as an object is is a a problem and not the plot. <laughs> And even the most expendable of them, the unnamed child in what was now a thousand years ago, yeah. um, even that person, um, th there's like this weird thing where like, it matters that it was an unnamed child from our perspective that Rhapsody cares about and gives up her freedom and like in a way that constrains her into the present until a particular like really nice thing happens um like she's continuing to live under this constraint that she accepted in order to s try and save this kid and it 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 means that even though this person is not named to us, the book treats them and their life as extremely important, even over a thousand years after they have died. And I just, just thinking about how much this book, like, 
deeply cares about bodies and lives and consent and how to navigate trauma. It just, it's in dialogue with this so much that even, like, even when having it be that as part of the plot, these really terrible things happened to get somebody else to have a reaction. It's not, we didn't have to watch that happen to that kid, but we see Rhapsody be affected by that happening. We don't watch what happens to Prudence, which is part of why I don't know if she was alive for what happened to her, because we get the threat that maybe she will be, maybe she won't. And part of why I don't know is because the author didn't linger on it. The author didn't make us sit through it. But we get the impact. We get the most, we get the most human and autonomous moments that they had. And then we don't have to sit around and watch the objectification. Yeah. And, and even with the incident with Joe, I think that's the most graphic one. Yeah, what happened a graphic with- moment in the book. Yes. Uh, what happened with Joe is that she is raped by the Rakshas, who looks like um, someone who we care like about Ash. and trust. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. looks like Ash. And when that happens, the way the book plays it is that, as we mentioned in the previous section, for about 10 to 15 pages, we think maybe he's the one who did it. Uh, But it doesn't leave it longer than that, because the point, like, uh, just the way this all plays out is just so well handled. Trying to think how to describe it. What happens to her, it affects her. We see how it affects her. And because, um, because unlike Prudence, she lives we we see the after effects we see what she we see what she at least is willing to say to someone else um about how she's handling it and what she thinks about it and we get body language descriptions and like it it really we see the way that this event made her unable to trust the people around her we see the way that it like with the the tendril thing like it, it set her up to die like it kept trying to hurt her even after the assault happened and yeah it is the most graphic and disturbing things in these books and it is less graphic than some stuff that just like casually gets tossed into the middle of other books because dear audience i know i know you know them the ones that have like a random assault in the middle of the book, like the kind of thing that made us want to have this podcast. <laughs> and and this this isn't that. Like this is even gosh, this is even like Paxinarian does different other things well, but this even is less of that trope than Paxinarian is. Like just thinking of this other series that we read. Um Anyway, just because with Joe, we get to see the aftermath, we get to see how it affects Joe to just be used like that. It's like, did you have any more thoughts on this? That's most of what I had is just, it is, it feels like a very large thing to talk about, but we don't. Like, the way we don't linger on it means that it ends up being hard to discuss in a way. Well, because we, yeah. We can actually talk about that briefly because. Sure. So, we mentioned this in part one, but you actually called me uh, when you got to this point with Joe Mm -hmm. and needed, normally, (laughs) for our, our audience at home, normally Robin does not like, does not want spoilers of any kind. And sometimes that even includes like a hook that other people would want to know to get into a book and to even consider a book. I'm like, and, I'll read whatever, I just don't want spoilers. <laughs> right, right. Um, and this, Robin actually called me and basically wanted a spoiler, wanted reassurance basically to know if this book was setting it up for Ash to be a terrible rapist, terrible child rapist. 
And because yeah, Joe is a Joe teenager. Was underage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the answer is no. <laughs> no, it's not. And no, he's not. And then when we were talking about it a little bit later, uh, you know, Robin kind of came back and said, you know, if I had only read 10 more pages, <laughs> I would have known the answer. This book does not. This book is. Let me see what my copy it's is officially. Pages. Okay. Yeah. This book is 700 pages. This incident. Oh, yeah. Almost exactly. Uh, this incident is less, like, probably less than 10, definitely less than 15 of those pages. And then it's not only over, we have a resolution. And yeah. this this book takes us through these things and has these topics and has these characters going through these horrific things. But the, but the ones that are the most graphic, the ones that are the most traumatic, the ones that are the most final... Those those scene descriptions don't linger, and we as a as a an audience, we get our resolutions, even if the characters are still grappling with the aftermath, even if there's still things to be done, um, like Ash has to has to do some things afterward after this to take care of himself. Um, those things still have to happen, but the conclusion of will it be okay, and is the author wanting us to experience this that question is answered incredibly quickly and in a very um i don't want to say in a non-traumatic way but in a way that very clearly (laughs) cares about the reader and does not want the reader to sit there suffering or throw the book away yeah the resolution is not non-traumatic but no the resolution um, is not non-traumatic but i would argue that it's it's not cathartic but it's pretty close (laughs) Uh, justice in this case for this one event on the precise creature is swift and brutal yeah. and deadly and final. <laughs> With like, no, I was shocked by how fast that happened. I yeah. thought for sure that that was going to be the plot of book three. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's not. Not only not the plot of book three. That particular thing is is over, and book two still has a way to go. Uh, I thought it was going to be like book one, we find out it's a thing. Book two, (laughs) oh crap, it's really, really a thing. Book three, we go fight it. And I was wrong about that. Well, Um, to be fair, the Raksha's master, the Fedor, is still around. Oh, sure. That's going to be book three. That's going to be book three. But But the actual perpetrator of the rapes is is dead almost as soon as they find out that it's happening. Yeah. And, and that's, that, that is the kind of thing where like, you know, there's books that put their, their audience, their readers through that trauma for sometimes whole trilogies Mm -hmm. waiting to see if the perpetrator will, will get away with it and, and, or will, or will face retribution. And in this case, the answer is very, very quick. The answer is, nope, this is bad. We went after it immediately. Now we have the way to, and it's done. (laughs) They even move up their timeline. They do. They alter oh, their, their actual timeline. And, yeah. yeah. It, it has the feel of, oh, we have the time. opportunity. Let's end it now. It does not have the feel of, this was always going to happen this way. And isn't it traumatic that someone was hurt first? No, the, the, the book doesn't do that at all. Instead, it's, we have a shot. We know where it is. Let's take advantage of the moment. And it means that then, for the reader, the trauma is done in about 10 pages. Yeah. It's very good. <laughs> Awful topics. Very good. Very good writing. Very good resolution. Yeah, because, like, I, I almost described this book as, like, light, and I'm like, mm, nope, not the <laughs> CWs I have to put in here. <laughs> well, this is, not a, this is not a light read for most people page-wise, and it's not a light read topic-wise, but it's a very good read. And it is not as dark as most doorstoppers. True. Like, it's not. Like, I, I had not read these before. And I'm like, wow, I just, the, like, repeated discussions of the importance of bodily autonomy. Like, I know that's our previous section's topic, but just, there's so much of that. That's woven through through all of this, just consistently. Like, you could learn what that is, even if you didn't learn the term, from how it's handled in here. Like, it might even have the term bodily autonomy in here. Like, I know it has body and autonomy in the same sentence more than once. Mm-hmm. 
Anyway, as for the weaponization. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm glad you I'm glad you brought up the the child from book 1 because I definitely had not been thinking of that, but the discussion of it echoed even into this book and it definitely does form kind of a of a trio with this. And I hope I hope there aren't any more that fit in this category because I don't want to watch that in the book happen to anybody else. Uh, um, don't don't tell me no spoilers. Okay. I won't. <laughs> um, but just uh, given what continued to be a theme in book two, I won't be surprised if it happens again or comes up again. Can you believe we've been friends for seven years? And it all started because I compared you to Alana the Lioness. Tamara Pierce really set the tone of our friendship. A love of magic. Briar Moss. Fantasy. Briar Moss. Powerful women. And of course, Briar Briar Moss. Moss. I'm Anna. And I'm MJ. And we invite you to join our circle of friendship. Where we do a chapter-by-chapter deep dive into the Circle of Magic series by Tamara Pierce. We answer important questions like, how does Moonstream let certain dedicates take care of children? Can you imagine anyone else but Mandy Patinkin playing Nico? Knives, Briar. And Knives! Join us every other Monday at cofpodcast.libsyn.com or wherever you download podcasts. But seriously, Knives... On to the wrap-up and ratings. In case you didn't look too closely at the show notes and just came straight to the wrap-up, we only had two topics this time because one of them was multifaceted and covered several characters. Our second topic is just so pervasive throughout the book that most things that we were like, oh, we could talk about this for a third topic. The answer was, oh, well, that's actually the second one again so we just kind of rolled with it yep for the gratuity rating for bodily autonomy yeah it's (laughs) it it is severe i feel like on our ratings for this we're gonna be pretty unilateral (laughs) on Mm -hmm. everything which is a lot easier when you only have two instead of three but also (laughs) yeah uh the weaponization is severe is severe and then for the Trauma, integral, interchangeable, or irrelevant bodily autonomy. It's integral to the plot. Yeah. Uh, The weaponization, we've got three different ones. Do you think they all have the same rating? I think that in theory, if you were to argue about probably two... No, one of these. No, I would say one of them is potentially irrelevant but it does reinforce the other things one of them Mm -hmm. is interchangeable but that character would have to go away somehow and i think the other one is integral yeah yeah the go away somehow is what makes it interchangeable yeah so i would say the yeah i i would say as a whole though i think the whole topic is integral because it is so Mm -hmm. permeable it's so so everywhere the the non-spoiler way to say it the one that we've known about since book one is irrelevant the one that is midway through is interchangeable and then the one closer to the end is integral i would say as a topic though this is an integral as a topical it's integral Okay. Yeah, because I, I think we have this in more than just the three things, the three examples we talked about. Um, yeah. And I think it goes back to some of our topics from book one, too. I think I think as a whole, we can't separate it out and say that it's not. Mm-hmm. And I think if we had expanded the uh, gender of the characters we were talking about, then we would have even more we examples. We would definitely which, have more. Yeah. Yeah, which were each integral. For sure. Yep. So integral overall, but with varying elements. Care. Was the trauma treated with care in voice, language, phrasing, etc.? For bodily autonomy, yeah. Uh, enough. Enough seems right. Yeah, it, I think I think this is another one of those those topics and those books. I'm going to probably end up saying this for both, so I'm going to go ahead and uh-huh. say it now. I think 
to treat it with purely just care would be to either take it out of the story entirely or minimalize it to the point of it being nothing and having no impact. Yeah. And with all. with bodily but, autonomy, part of that care is using a magical analog. That's true. Yes. This is this is very magical and not possible in our real world. Yeah. And uh, but I think I think for the traumas and the point of them in the story and how they are and the and the actual horror of what mm-hmm. is happening in both of these topics, I think it was treated with probably as much care as it could have been given without cheapening it and diminishing yeah. it. Yeah. So I, I definitely think enough, but I, I like I said, without making it pointless and unhelpful, I don't think we could have just I could I don't think the author could have just gone to just care. Yeah, especially when there are other kinds of bodily autonomy that we didn't talk about in our particular section and yeah as, in general as a topic bodily autonomy including the specific thing we talked about and generally is treated yeah. with enough care yeah yeah that's fair uh with weaponization specifically um we have some instances that are treated with more care than others but again like i would say enough care there's no way for it to be just care without I, I it just gonna, not happening. Especially, I think I'm going to say, un- especially because of the the age and demographic of who is being weaponized in our examples. I think that also kicks it up to the point of like that couldn't happen and just be treated with care. So I think maybe the actual weaponization is treated with enough care, but it is surrounded by events that are difficult to treat with enough care and for some people it's going to be not enough care just because of what it is yeah that's fair because it is it is adjacent to a lot of like heavy hitters um, look in the the show notes for more yeah <laughs> yeah that's fair so we're gonna rate it as enough but if you look at our our show notes and think i want nothing to do with this even if it's done in a caring and well way then stay away yeah or message me and I'll send you back page numbers for when it when it ends. Yeah, the dark is very dark in here. For the point of view for trauma and aftermath, um, we've got pretty well done rotating perspectives in here. This isn't a sole narrator situation. And in general, we have the perspective, with the exception of one that takes place in book one in off screen, um, with the exception of that, We generally have the perspective of the person being hurt pretty consistently. And whenever we, whenever we don't, it's because something has come up repeatedly. And sometimes we have their perspective and sometimes we have the perspective of someone they are talking to about it. Also, in any particular scene, if we have more than one victim, we usually get everybody. Yeah. Uh, there is a point where Rhapsody is talking to one of our weaponization victims. And that victim is turning around and intentionally hurting her. And we get a rotating perspective in the moment. Yeah. Because we kind of see every victim as they're being injured or about their injuries. (laughs) So, which is difficult and also very good. It wasn't confusing to read, but yeah, there were some rotating moments. No, it wasn't confusing to read, but like to write? Oh, man. (laughs) How do you make that decision? (laughs) Like... How do you know when the moment is to switch perspectives without losing something? Is Yeah. Uh, aspiring writer tip. Um, I think I actually have one. So you can have not, not all of your characters have to be up on all of the issues, but you really ought to have somebody who's up on each of them. So one of the things in this in this series and it very specifically in this book is so far they're engaged a lot with consent and the idea of consent. And repeatedly there is one character who has very definite specific ideas about consent and they are, um, they're not using our current language because this book is from 20 years ago. Yeah. But they are ones where I could definitely like stand by it and be like, yeah, if that's how you 
approach consent, like, you'll be fine. Like, this, this, this all seems good. I don't see any major pitfalls from this. So you have one character who has that perspective, and then they run into other characters who, like, just don't. And part of what they do is say, hey, wait, no, I didn't say you could do that. I didn't say that you could do that with me, with my body, with my stuff, whatever it is. Um, and so you're able to portray someone not being good at the thing and someone understanding what needs to happen. And then there's a dialogue, there's a discussion, there's something. Um, and I think that balance was really important because... And then there's a variety of different issues where, like, um, the character who's, like, really up on consent isn't always up on fantasy world racism and, you know, different things. And making sure that someone has what we're supposed to understand to be the right perspective is very important. And making that clear is very important because if no one... If none of the characters are good about things, and then it takes a couple books for something to happen and they figure it out, that can feel very alienating. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. And this is definitely a book where we pretty much, and well, a series where we consistently always, when something is happening, have a voice, not always the main characters necessarily, mm-hmm. especially if they aren't there, but we almost right. always have a voice loudly yelling that the thing that's happening is bad and wrong and not okay. And that it shouldn't stand. And then as, you know, we're on book two out of three, but things don't just stand. Yeah. Stuff changes. Stuff changes. Stuff gets corrected. People grow mm-hmm. in this book. We we kind of talked about that a little bit with our um, misogyny and racism topics in book one. We have characters that start out as pretty misogynistic and pretty racist for the, for the definitions of race in the book and grow actively. And call each other out consistently. Yeah, and it there this this whole series just has a a an abundance of that <laughs> in every in every trauma in every situation. There's always someone yelling that this thing is bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite non traumatic thing about the book? Can I do my one from the first one? Well, <sighs> I have I I know I know um <laughs> I. Oh man, now I'm thinking of the one that will be my favorite in the third book. Oh no. Book two. Focus on book two. I know, but but book two is like right in the middle of everything. <laughs> That's why it's book two. I don't I don't know. I, okay. So my favorite non traumatic thing about sure. the book is and I think this happened in book one, but it like comes back in book two in like this yeah. fun way. So, like, somewhere there's a tree that has a harp in it, and the harp is singing the song of the tree, and it's just, like, making the tree better, and keeping the tree alive and healthy and not, or minimally, magically corrupt by bad stuff. And so, just picturing all these people being like, why is there a harp in a tree playing (laughs) by itself? Just, like... My favorite thing is picturing what has got to be happening for, like, this entire book where we aren't focusing on this tree or this harp at all. It does come up at least once in the book, though. All right. I think my favorite non-traumatic thing is an extension of book one, but not the same. I just like that Rhapsody is becoming... So my favorite thing in book one was was the music and the naming as a concept, right? I think my favorite non-traumatic thing in book two is... Rhapsody kind of getting a handle on that that magic and that power and starting to be creative with it. The tree is a good example that you listed. Um, but I think just like her her ability to to, you know, like um just have fun and make her magic work and do what she wants it to. She's starting to kind of figure that out and get good at it. <laughs> And it's just interesting. All right. Uh, That's it for Prophecy, Child of Earth. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll catch you in a fortnight. (laughs) 
All music used in this podcast was created by Nicole as Heartbeat Art Co. and is used with permission. You can follow us on Twitter at Books That Burn, all one word. You can email us with questions, comments, or book recommendations at Books That Burn at Yahoo.com. Support us on Patreon.com slash Books That Burn. All patrons get access to our upcoming book list and receive a one time shout out. You can leave us an iTunes review. This helps people to find the show. And find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks.